Welcome to Unlimited Views Podcast. I'm Rasad. This is Aris. Uh, welcome to our episode nine. We have a special guest today. Yes, sir. From Canada, our boy Andrew Coates. Thank you for being with us today, man. How are you doing? Yeah, you make Canada sound like it's like some little small place when it's what? Geographically, the second largest country in the entire world. So, Dude, you are a neighbor. You are a neighbor. Yeah. We're from New York. You guys are from New York, and New York is the center of the universe. Probably like and everything else is uh, is very peripheral, right? <laughs> yeah, man. But thank you so much. I hope I get to visit one day. I know it's a beautiful city. It's not a good time right now to try. You, you know, you've never been? I've never been. I've been in various places in the U.S., but I've never made it to New York yet. I got some friends there who own gyms. Awesome. There, so you you said beautiful city. Eh. Not not too beautiful, but we're, we're good. We're cool. <laughs> what is the old saying? It's a great place to visit. You know, not such a great place to live, I've heard. So I got some, I've got some clients who love going there and visiting there. They, they are, New York is their favorite city. We, we, we do have plenty of different uh, types of restaurants and all. A, a lot of uh, different cultures. Yeah, so yeah. it's cool in that aspect. But as far as living, man, it's too expensive. Way too expensive. I've heard that. Yeah, I've actually read the book uh, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. I'm a big book aficionado, and it's a great book about service, and it talks about Gramercy Tavern, and uh, I'm trying to remember, well, obviously, there's the guys behind Shake Shack, but I know there's a whole bunch of different great restaurants, legendary restaurants, and kind of, with what's going on right now, I hope they all survive. This is tough on the restaurant industry. Very, very yeah. tough on the industry right now, and we, we've seen it firsthand, uh, because we both work in the city. So They're doing, like, takeouts. Oh, Everything is takeout, especially maybe some of the restaurants that have uh, well, like outside seating. outdoor seatings, they're taking advantage of it. They're even trying to build it now, like where people used to be able to park on the street. <laughs> now they're actually just building yeah. little like patio areas. For so people to so go they in. eat with the car fumes and everything. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> You know, I imagine it's probably the same thing as getting a New York hot dog, right? Those are. <laughs> there you go. That's I'll, a good have, I'll have to experience it for myself at some point, but it it goes to to show what you have to do to adjust to the times that we're in. And, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, it really is. Exactly. I'm in the fitness industry, and you know our industry has had to adapt. There are friends of mine in gyms all over the U.S. Uh, my friend Mark Fisher in New York City. Uh, they have a couple locations. They've decided to shut one uh, for Mark Fisher Fitness. So they're figuring out whatever the hell they can do to to get back open again and survive this. And I've got friends with gyms in California, and they've been they reopened, and now they've been ordered to shut back down again. So it's scary. Yeah, to yeah. yeah. I mean, going online and figuring out other ways to generate revenue and to help your clientele. A lot of the clients who themselves are either nervous about coming to the gym or or can't if we're the closing here in Edmonton, Alberta. We've probably been had one of the best results comparatively in all of North America. We haven't had a lot of cases. We did shut down. We were able to reopen pretty safely. Things have been pretty reasonable here. So, you know, I've been able to work in one capacity or another the entire way through, which has, you know, saved my ability to earn my livelihood and take care of my clientele. Yeah, yeah. So that, that thank you again for, for doing this interview with us. So you, you're, you're, you're in fitness, right? Yep. Fitness. He's a per personal, He's a personal trainer. trainer. I'm what, a personal trainer. When did you start? Like, what, what got trainer? you into yeah. it? Like, where did you decide that, you know, this is what I want to do? You'll hear people in fitness talk about their passion for fitness and they want to help people. Okay. And it's a common myth that you should, you know, chase your dreams, your passions. I sort of fell into this a decade ago. I've been doing it almost 10 years. I have worked out in gyms a lot longer, probably a very dedicated gym regular for about 18 years. And before that, Wow. high school athletics and I had a bench in my basement and you name it but I fumbled around through various different careers um, I have a bachelor of commerce degree from you know back in Newfoundland where I grew up but I never really liked the suit and tie and I never really like you know sales stuff and so eventually I got asked repeatedly off the gym floor of a gym that I just worked out at to come and be a trainer they felt that I would know a lot and I would do a good job and it actually worked out rather well and initially it was a job it was just a a thing to do but very quickly it took on a, a life where you know I really enjoyed it it was fulfilling I did well with it and over time it became this all-consuming passion to where I now not only have a full-time business coaching people and some online work as well um, I write for two major publications uh, testosterone nation which is one of the biggest bodybuilding websites in the world and uh, and true coach which is a company that uh, does online 
coaching uh, software. And then it turned into hosting a conference here in Edmonton. Uh, we had to scuttle it this year just due to COVID, but we had it last year. It was really successful. We'll do it again in 2021. And I have a podcast of my own that we, me and my friend had been running for three years. And I just recently assumed just myself, he's going to be too busy to continue it. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of like passion projects within the career. Uh, and I certainly love writing and I, I love coaching my clients. and I want to do this forever, but it didn't necessarily start out that way. And I never had a vision for what I would probably be doing one day. And you see a lot of people, there's, there's good books on this. Um, so good. They can't ignore you by an author named Cal Newport, which is my favorite in on this particular topic. And he advocates for this. It's not, it's not blind chase your passion. It's find a passion within something you're very skilled at or that you are, as opposed to being that burnt out driftwood that a lot of organizations, public and private employees end up like because they hate their jobs. And right? that's, that's no way to exist. There are people who work in, a lot of careers that you know anyone listening might think is mundane or they're not interested in but a lot of people have found passion and fulfillment within those particular careers yeah or find something else you know because like i'm a true believer in that as well a lot of people maybe start working for a company and then they go like a total different route which is crazy i'm a, I'm a and then as for example of that yeah so it, it just it just depends. Like I think you have to just get your foot in the door somehow, and you'll find your way. It, it, One way or another, you're gonna find your way. Like that quote goes, uh, "Love what you do, and you'll never work a day in your life." And absolutely, right? Yes, I think that's the. Yeah. And love. take it a little further, you know, find love within what you're already doing as well, right? Because yeah. again, I I truly feel that a lot of the most fulfilling jobs aren't the things that you would think of on the surface would automatically be things you're passionate about. And I think a lot of things that people are passionate about, you know, if they go and take their hobbies into a career, all of a sudden, well, they no longer enjoy their hobby and they don't like it as a career, or they find that there's no money in what they're actually oh, doing. Yeah, that's a big yeah. problem, right? That's, that's um, the biggest problem because what if you're, and then like, but then I get, that's where the passion comes into play, right? Because at the end of the day, you'd rather be doing something you love rather than be like, like in your case, be sitting behind the desk all day. And really be miserable. Although you may be paid a lot of money, you know. So. True. I had a thought there that sort of slipped my mind. Um, it's all good. It, it'll come back to me if I can remember. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about, uh, for example. So, being a personal trainer, what are some of the biggest, I guess, um, uh, battles that you have to face with your your clients? Well, like a client faces that you know that you, well, you see them suffering, and you somehow help them adjust to. With, with a lot of personal trainers, you know, we have, quote, advanced knowledge, at least we should, about training and nutrition. And so it's really important to remember that the people in front of you don't have all that same level of knowledge. So they're fighting unique battles. Uh, they have demands on their time and their ability to devote a mental energy to their health and well-being. And, and they're trying because they're paying you and they want to show up at the gym. And some people are, like, like clockwork, they they book and they have the same time slot, you know, eight years in a row and they never miss a session. And there are people that week to week really struggle with, you know, work or just motivation. And so it, right? you, it's, it's not as simple as giving some a plan, someone a plan and they will adhere to it. In fact, I found very, very few clients. There are some, but very few are what I would call perfectly adherent. With most people, that's where your job really kicks in is you have to find the way to communicate with them, the buttons to push, to be empathetic, I can't stress empathy enough, to help someone get from where they are to where they wanna be. And not everybody has the patience or the ability to work with people where they are, and they just have this expect expectation that it's easy or that certainly that clients are lined up around the corner to come train with you. It takes, it takes a pretty dedicated effort to build a brand, to build a referral network, to take good care of your existing clientele and, and to find new people um, but yeah people if it were that easy for most people they wouldn't even be hiring trainers so you have to coach people through their struggles their difficulties and it's not as if it's just a one-time thing and they're all good most of the people i've ever worked with there are some sort of lifelong pull and demand on their time and their motivation their effort. and if i'm lucky enough to have that long-term relationship with them i'm constantly helping them with some 
part that just doesn't come easy for them. Yeah. Are, are you, what is the most difficult part when you're training somebody? Is it basically getting them to, I guess, having a nice, a good, a better diet? Or is it basically getting them to be physically actually doing so physically performing at the gym? What, what is more difficult? It varies based on the person. There are some people that nutrition comes pretty inherent with. Uh, often enough, nutrition is the bigger battle. Uh, you get someone into the gym consistently and they enjoy the experience, making sure they enjoy it and finding what works for them is an essential part of this for sure. It helps a lot with when that the workout behavior is consistent, it tends to serve as a linchpin behavior where they automatically just eat better, but they're not necessarily going to be flawless with their eating. So ongoing nutrition is a challenge. They'll answer all your questions or they'll tell you all the right things for the hour or two you get in front of them. Um, but you have no control over what they're doing in time. So it's yeah. really important that you're having conversations with them and reach with them and buy in with them, that it's helping them with the skills or attitudes or choices when you're not in front of them. And that's very unique to each different client. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and like, because as we were talking, like New York is – crazy, crazy busy city. There's, uh, they do all kinds of different jobs. Um, personal training has actually gotten very, very popular here as well. I actually have two family members that uh, are into the field. Uh, in Canada, just as, you know, just uh, curiosity, is how, how, is, how high is the competition there for personal well, trainers? There is this belief that the industry is saturated. And, well, let's look around at the world. And we have a world where you know, and forgive the, anyone who, you know, thinks that it's not politically correct to say that there's obesity in the world. There's obesity in the world. There's a lot of it. The percentage of people, it, it's high. Mm-hmm. And the fitness industry hasn't really made a massive dent in this. So there's, you can think about every other personal trainer as your competition. And now with online training, your competition is broader across the world. Or you can focus on yourself and just continue to create the best message possible through all your media mm-hmm. to where you're not worried about competing with anyone else. You just take control of what you can do as a coach to attract people to your media feed and decide that's the coach I want to work with. I need to be really busy and to make a very good living, you know, 30, 35 clients out of a city of a million plus the ability to do online training, which spreads farther and wider. I have a client in California, for example. Wow. I'm online. That's great. And we have, I mean, the cliche, you know, what, seven plus billion people in the world. Now, you know, like babies in China aren't going to be training with me, but <laughs> medically, you know, any adult anywhere who has an internet connection and speaks the same language I do, and most, a lot of people in the world speak English, so therefore, I theoretically could reach any of a couple of billion people and coach them. So, yes, there's a lot of personal trainers out there. And there are some very, very successful ones. And there are some brands that can coach a lot of people through, you know, larger companies or systems. But we haven't reached even a small portion of the people that need the help. And so I just choose not to have the attitude that it's saturated or it's difficult. Mm-hmm. And so I just work really, really hard on you know, doing a really good job with the clientele I have, uh, you know, I always get a steady stream of referral business and I get, you know, inquiries through my social media. So there, yes, there's a saturation amongst average or mediocre fitness professionals, but there is a ton of room for really passionate, really skilled, hardworking people who relentlessly pursue education and work on Instead of being upset because this Instagram trainer is showing her butt and has, you know, 10 times the number of followers you do and is demonstrating exercise wrong, complaining about that's a complete waste of time because then you're, you have an external locus control. You're, you're crying about somebody else and what they're doing. Well, why don't you worry about what you can do? And instead of being mad, this, this person has 10 times your followers. Why don't you do something? And again, with integrity. Yeah, to stand out and do it. To stand out and build your own following. And that's the best use of your energy. Yeah. So, you know, I just, I don't worry about it ever being saturated or being too competitive. And if I am struggling with that side of it, then that's on me to do something better versus work, harder, work smarter, you know, to really get ahead. 
it makes sense. Absolutely. It makes sense. From what I see, uh, I, you obviously have a great of, like, amount of commitment. Uh, I, I have a funny story myself. When I was in high school, uh, I was actually a personal trainer. <laughs> so, ah, wearing a shirt. Cool. For like two weeks. Uh, so what happened is as a final test, uh, in my weight training class, they would give us a freshman, and then uh, you'd have two or three weeks to basically show uh, improvement, right? So it, it's just, it, it's amazing to me how you can talk so dedicated about it and how committed you are, but those two, three weeks, he did get a good result, but I was like in pain the whole time, man. Just to basically sit there, have him do his sets, his reps, and it was just like, I can't do this, you know? So... It's not for you. And there are a lot of people that might look at what I do with a career uh, or ways I go about it and just realize, hey, I, I can never do that. Well, you don't know. Not for until you exactly. Try it. For sure. I also respect, uh, I look at the, the careers of a lot of my clientele and there are careers that people have, like anyone who is in technical trade stuff. I've tri worked a lot, work with a lot of electricians and boiler makers or that type and uh, cheap metal workers and, and mechanics. And I just don't have any intuitive idea about how those sort of things work. So I look at them and, and can tell a lot of them are very skilled at it and I admire that and respect it. And I guess that's how someone would look at someone in my position, right? So it can be, it can be very daunting to look at an experienced fitness professional and go, man, like how the, I feel so stupid. I've done one course and I hear this person talk and like I could never know this, but. The evolution over time is you'd be surprised what you learn and absorb if you do expose yourself to it and you put in the effort. And now I, I'm much further ahead 10 years later than even some of the people I was listening to early on and learned from. And I could never have imagined that. It's and experience and experience and how much you put on yourself. So if you are determined enough and you want to succeed and, and move ahead, even those people, like, you know, they say, uh, you know, the people you look up to, they, they, they no longer are the ones that you look up to. They're your competition at this point, but you're even surpassing them. So that, that's... Well, like, even for you, like, uh, the, the way you started into the finance world, you started since, like, 16. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, you I'm were just dedicated kind of moving, to it, move, moving up into the state. I think you just, like I said, you have to get your foot in the door. And, like, if you really want to do something, if you push yourself, it'll take time. But I think you'll still, you'll still be able to make it. So nothing can really stop you, man. Yeah. Well, that's really great. If you're determined, if you are determined, absolutely. You'll do it. Right. Every needs a little bit of luck and good fortune along the way, too. Anyone who benefits from luck. But if you put in the effort to learn and you have a good positive attitude about it, you put yourself in a position to benefit from luck. Anyone who just has this entitled attitude and just waits around for luck to happen to them, is not, yeah. nothing good ever happens. Oh, tell us also, like, how do you start your day? Tell us a, a day in the life of Andrew Coates, personal trader. Tell us. So the big myth about, oh, getting up super early in the morning and going to work out, there's none of that crap. Um, I get up. <laughs> so you're not a morning person? <laughs> in fact, for many years, my days start, my work day starts at 10 a.m., which means I get up at 8. For many years, I actually started my work day at 12, worked till about 9, and then I would work out. So I was... You know, you get your night owls and your, your morning lark sort of uh, thing, which is a real physiological thing. And I'm more of a night owl. But I shifted it to where I work about 10 a.m. in the morning. And I'll, I'll work into the evening. I actually have a long day and I'll have little gaps and breaks to do other things. But I, I like my career. So four days a week, I'm 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. or close. And then Fridays, it'll be a shorter day. And then the weekend, I'll do a few hours in the afternoon. But my day starts when I absolutely must get up. And then... Uh, I'm someone I like a bigger breakfast, so it's you know I'm I'm a big guy. I'm you know six foot two, two hundred sixty pounds, so <laughs> it means I need fuel. So it's it's a big breakfast, and I try to sit down and create a little time where I usually try to put up a social media post, you know, career related stuff. Uh, usually it's pre planned, it's something I've already got from the night before, the day before, and then uh, you know it's it's the shower in the morning. I don't I don't know how people can do the shower before bed and then just get up and go. I, I can't do that. I, I do the shower in the morning thing. And then, yeah, it's, it's a black coffee and then it's uh, a drive to work. And there's nothing magical about it. I'm not, God, the website that I write for, uh, T Nation, they recently, one of them, one of their guys put up a post. I think it was, yeah, I think it's the editor, Chris. 
and he put up a post about these 13 or 14 like morning ritual things you know you, you do your yoga or you do your your meditation and then you you write in your your journal and you know there's this that and everything else and it's like and then you lose your job because you didn't show up to work and then <laughs> i don't know who has time for a lot of this cliched you know morning ritual type stuff and you read books like uh tim ferris's tools for titans has got a lot of these things and asks a lot of these people about their morning rituals and ultimately it's there's not there's no magic behind this stuff i mean i think that there's a strong correlation between meditation and success sure i'm interested in it i've never actually sat down to figure it out yet i probably will but you know, I'm not into journaling in a sense. I write plenty, but I, I'm not journaling my thoughts for the day. You also, you also read a lot too, right? Because I read a lot. Also by your bookcase in, in the background too. I mean, you're a big reader. He actually wrote, uh, he said he reads about 80 books a year. Yeah. So now wow. to, be, to be technically fair, and people get very shitty about the semantics of the word read and audiobooks. So I consume about 80 books a year. The last I think, three years or so. Yeah, there. A lot of and a lot of them are on video. You listen to audio yeah. books, th those yeah. count. Yeah, totally. And, you know, some people like to argue and say, oh, you know, audio isn't the same. You don't absorb the same as you do if you uh, read it. And, well, I think some people are just, I've seen people pointing out, because technically speaking, okay, you know, it's different for different people. I retain audio very well. If it works for you, great. And I listen to audio books when I'm driving. And it's either that or music. It's not like I can pull up a, a actual book and read while I'm driving. I mean, yeah. once we get to the point where we have self-driving cars, hell yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah. that will actually happen. Yeah, we do that. Or, we could do that too, like because we're, we take transportation to go to work, right? Yeah. So I'm spending yeah. an hour on a bus, uh, and like I might yeah. be reading on my phone, listening to podcasts, doing something, right? So well, you know, if you're on public transit, you could actually have a physical book. But I like the audiobooks, and I've gotten used to it. We can absorb it quickly, so I listen on two times speed. And I also uh, listen to audiobooks when I'm cooking. So that adds up to being a lot. And then I try to set actual time for physical books, especially training type books that you can't do on audio is, is one of my preferences there. So you just want to be as well educated as possible. And there's a lot to be said. You hear this a lot, how CEOs, successful people read a lot. And I think there's something to that. Um, there's a very strong correlation. It may be causing and they may be absorbing a lot of ideas and learning to the point where they're successful or just a habit of reading could be a, something that correlates with a lot of the other habits and behaviors, the disciplines that otherwise lead to successful professional lives. And I think it's a little from column A and a little from column B. But I found that I enjoy reading and, and I'm not particularly interested in television outside of the occasional you know, movie, uh, I can't watch movies by myself, but you know, if I have company, then sure, you know, maybe sit down and watch a movie, just watch The Old Guard with Charlize Theron on Netflix. That was fucking great. That was a fun movie. That, um, that was the, the idea of that. I've never, that, n nobody has ever made movies like that, at least that I'm aware of. So it was a great that, movie. That movie. was cool. And like, if anybody hasn't watched it, I don't want to give away what it's about, but there's sort of this existential dread in the movie of, of a particular fate that could happen to the characters because of the nature of their special ability. And, uh, you know, anyone who's seen it, we're talking about the, let's just put it as the iron coffin in the water. And that's all I'll say. And that's a scary uh, fate to imagine happening. Even. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's really cool. I've seen it. It was crazy. It's crazy. But I, like I, I enjoy sitting down and reading. It's something I feel very fulfilled when I, you know, get through books. If I, even if it's just 10 pages a day, like a lot of people are, oh, they think they should start reading and they find it really daunting and they're overwhelmed by even thinking about it. Don't try to like read the book in one sitting. That's not going to work. But if you read 10 pages a day, then a 300 page book is done in a month. And then all of a sudden you're doing 12 books a year and 12 books a year is probably 11 more books than most people read in a year. And that one book might've been a coloring book for a lot of people. So. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're way ahead of most people and i think that your life and whatever outcome professional pursuit cannot help but be better if you make time for those 10 pages a day it's actually a particular thing out of the book the slight edge if you're looking for a, a habit-based book to change your life this is not a dramatic you know jump up and all of a sudden snap your fingers and your whole life's different this is a Understanding the power of very incremental behaviors each day that will cumulatively add up. There's another book called 
uh, the compound effect. I think it's Darren Hardy. Same concept, right? It's it's the compounding interest on these little behaviors that add up over time that you don't feel. Exercise is this way. Right, exactly. You know, one day the next, you're talking about like trying to get results out of someone in two to three weeks. Two to three weeks is barely any time to even notice anything. Yeah. You know, look in the mirror every day, you don't see the changes. That's why we take before and after photos a lot of the time because over time, you compare them across yeah. a month, two months, three months, and There's what you don't really notice all of a sudden you're like, wow, the contrast between the two pictures. It's because the little daily behaviors added up. But one particular day does not launch you forward in, in a massive way with your fitness and nor will it with a, a book you're reading. So how long, how long is your, your session, for example? Like, let's say if you're doing a session with a client or even for yourself, uh, how long do you normally work out in a day? Um, well, for clients, I mean, the sessions are an hour. I mean, you know, between changing over whatever it ends up being 58 minutes and one of my girls today, you know, I, I had some extra time, and so I offered her I'd stick her out for one more set, and she's, you know, she's like, nope, <laughs> I'm good. And uh, she's not a good worker, but the gym was hot, so she, she had enough with one minute left. Um, me, I like to slow my workouts down a bit, and a typical workout for me is probably an hour and a half, and it's a commitment that I make to myself. Yeah, makes sense. I also earmark that I tend to train, work out myself every day, because life will occasionally interfere. Right. to where you don't have time for a full workout or you do a half one. I did kind of a half of one today because I had a, um, I was helping a friend who's going to leave a company and become an independent personal trainer. So I took some time to get on a call with him about you guys. And then it's uh, two of my best friends. It's their little, little girl's eighth birthday and their family to me. Oh, nice, nice. So I leave here and I go over there and uh, I got some Legos for them and I have dinner. I haven't seen them as much as usual just due to the events of the last few months. Sure, man. Life, life does get in the way. Whatever you do in your profession, like sometimes, but it's, remember, it's committing, right? So if you commit to it, like you said, do an hour, an hour and a half. If you could commit to it, the, the small changes will eventually, you'll see those, you know? Add up in a big way. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. But uh, well, I mean, you work in finance, so you think about the savings. On a daily basis, a monthly basis, you save a little bit or even an annual basis, it may not add up to be that much, but the compound effect over years, Absolutely. It's that habit and that behavior, it's not waiting to cash in on a lottery ticket. It's the discipline to save every month. And yeah. a lot of people struggle to do that. Humans struggle to delay gratification. They struggle not to eat the cake or the pie or the pizza. And there's room for that. There's also room to, to spend on, you know, things that you really value in life. But you still have to underlying save enough each month so that we have retirement and you have to be consistently active enough and manage your nutrition enough so that way your health is in a good place now and later on. Absolutely. Do, do you follow like a specific diet or for you is just go along with the flow? So diets in my industry, you hear a lot of things about keto dieting or intermittent fasting, uh, veganism, vegetarianism, carnivore, right? some crazy stuff there. Um, if it fits your macros, I have probably been fairly lucky. And it's an example of being a trainer and not just seeing it through my lens, but understanding it from the client's point of view. I've always been active athletic and I've been fairly good with intuitively eating the fuel that I need for my goals. And because I'm a big guy and I'm really active, I can eat almost whatever I want. Pie and scotch and tacos are, are very regular parts of my you know, weekly nutrition. But at the same time, most of my underlying nutrition is what you consider to be healthy, uh, lean protein, you know, complex carbohydrate, fruits and vegetables, and, and otherwise healthy. But no, I don't adhere to a specific structure, and nor do I believe, and, and anyone credible in our industry would never say there's one diet that everybody should do. If someone's saying to you, everybody needs to do paleo, everybody needs to do keto, run the fuck away. This is not someone who has an unbiased education in nutrition. They're bought into one ideology and they've subscribed to it. So they treat it like it's a religion. Now, I understand vegetarians and vegans because there's a moral perspective for them. And you know, on one hand, you know, their ethical viewpoint, you know, it's a pretty valid one. You know, when they start saying it's also the healthiest diet, well, that's demonstratively false. There are some people who do really well on there's some people that really don't respond well at all to, to vegan diets. And there can be some mental health concerns with some of the things missing from a diet. 
you have people who are advocating carnivore diet and, and they tend to be real zealots where they think it's the only way. And I, I can't get behind the idea that, you know, not eating any vegetables is somehow good for you or healthier. But at the same time, our industry likes to sling mud and, and say nasty shit to people who believe in different things than they do. Even if the people, you know, from a scientific standpoint are probably wrong, that's also not a way to bridge the gap of disagreement. So I, I always try to approach things with open mind. And, and here's something that I try to, I'll, I'll give an example. If I have a client who comes to me and says, you know, hey, I want to try a keto diet, right? And I, I have made a few social media posts recently about this. I don't say that person, okay, keto's fucking stupid. Here's what you, you know, here's why it's stupid. Here's the problem with it. I go, okay. And I don't even think keto's stupid. It's just, it's not for everybody. Right. I say, all right, great. Let's try it. Um, I'm really glad that, you know, you're putting in the effort to research this. And, uh, you know, here's a couple things that are probably really important to understand about how keto works. And here's a couple of the really common myths. I just, I just tried it. So, yeah. I'm a there big... I can see he's like stifling laughter and shit. So maybe this stuff will make sense to you. And what you've done is you've got trust and rapport and buy-in from the client. And chances are, I, I, I like to say this too, if someone's coming asking you, hey, I'd like to try keto, there's a pretty good chance that they're already trying keto and they've got a friend or a family member who's trying to sell the idea and push them into it. So you don't want conflict between you and your client, you want trust. Now, let's say their attempt at keto goes up in flames. Well, then you're in a position of trust where they, they can come back to you and you can say, okay, well, you know what? that probably wasn't right for you. You know, are you willing to try this? Cause I think this might be the best way to approach it. Who knows? Maybe it works for them. I have an online client and she really likes her keto. There's, you know, aspects of it that are a bit of a challenge sometimes, but yeah, yeah. The, even with like, imperfect adherence, she's seen the best results in terms of her weight loss or energy and how she feels that she has in her entire life. So if I'd gone in and shit all over keto, well, that would damage that relationship. And she's a wonderful client. You know, she's great to work with and she works really hard. It depends, right? It depends on the person. Sometimes there's certain diets, you know, that really work for someone, but it doesn't work for somebody else. I, I think our first uh, YouTube episode, episode four, yeah. uh, I spoke about it. Um, I've try, I tried keto for two months, I believe. Uh, as far as the weight loss, it worked out great. I lost over, I think, 27 to 30 pounds. Okay. But uh, after the two months, I started having like crazy amounts of pain. I had like gastritis. I went, that was literally hell. I had to go through ho like hospitals, emergency rooms. It was insane. So that's, yeah, that's, that's deeply problematic. So some people do not do well on really high fat diets. And there's another myth about keto is that, you know, that the calories don't matter, that all you need to do is to eat, you know, high protein, high fat. First of all, if you're high protein, you're not in keto. Um, so you need to have a moderate amount of protein, a low amount of carbohydrates, right. and otherwise you you meet your calorie needs with fat. You right. can make any diet work and lose weight, and you need two conditions. One is you need to get your calorie intake right for your goals. So if weight loss is, you have to be in a deficit at least for a certain period of time. And it's got to be something that you'll consistently stick to. Because if you're cheating on your keto every weekend, binging on ice cream and cookies, well, <laughs> that's really not keto, and it's not really working for you, yeah. and it's perpetuating, you know, a disordered eating behavior. If in fact you are, you know, binging or, or engaging in unrestrained behavior, so you know you got to then ask yourself, okay, well, is this diet actually working for me? And that answer is probably no. So you want to be very, very careful when it comes to disordered eating behaviors like intermittent fasting is another popular quote fad diet where well i'll describe two diets to you okay i'm going to first i'm going to describe to you an eating disorder where someone is a binge eater and the second is i'm going to describe to you intermittent fasting so in the binge eating case someone restricts their their eating and they don't eat for most of the day and then at a very short setting they sit down and they demolish a ton of calories yeah. okay so, now intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting, you restrict your eating for a certain finite amount, a window. You're fasting, and then within a narrower window, you get to eat, you know, kind of whatever you want. But because of that narrow window, it's really, really hard to overconsume your calories. Now I've just put a nice little positive spin on something that's otherwise classically thought of as a negative thing. Now, yes, there are differences, and I'm 
you know, I'm being a little facetious here. You can make intermittent fasting work and clients of mine under the right structure have found it works great for their lifestyle and their energy. But it can, in some cases, be a really nice way of dressing up an eating disorder and legitimizing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. Very true. So, you know, you got to be careful with this stuff. Yeah, man. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. I know we, we took a little bit of your time today. Uh, you pleasure. Really, really uh, great information about just you, your personal training career and also the dieting as well. Because I know they go hand in hand. You know, you can't do one and not do the other because the results won't be there, you know, so. As far as for me, it was uh, the same thing as the last uh, podcast about the financial world. It was more of uh, you teaching me. <laughs> well, yeah. It was great. So, uh, very resourceful. Uh, thank you so much again. For having us, yeah. For, uh, for, 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 for taking the time to, to be on our episode. Um, I know you have a busy schedule, so we appreciate, we appreciate you taking the time. Come visit New York, man. We'll, yeah. we'll show you around, brother. We'll, it's going to happen, so we'll see. About <laughs> when right. things get better. When things get I better. Was to, I was supposed to hit uh, Kansas City, Seattle, Vegas for a conference, and Daytona Beach. And I was also going to go to Denver. So I had five things planned. And that all got the uh, so, but no, I'll, I'll eventually make my way down. And like I said, I got some friends in the New York area. Usually I come down for certain fitness events and hopefully there's something in there and we go from there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys awesome. having me on. Awesome, man. We were really, we'll, um, when you guys are on my social media. Awesome. 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 Sounds uh, good. For everyone that's interested, follow Andrew on Instagram at Andrew quotes, C O A T E S fitness. Definitely. All together, we'll tag him. We'll tag him. Uh, we'll we'll tag also him tag you video. on the YouTube video and on Instagram whenever we do release the episode. Uh, so follow, hit him up for questions. He's uh, actually I seen your story the other day. You were doing a question and answering type of thing, and that's great. So he's anyone he's very responsive. So it's you know. anyone who messages me with a question or anything, I always get back to them. Right? I always check the you know if I'm not following someone back, I always check the the general DMs and. I'm never too busy. I mean, my following's not so big that I've got friends who've got hundreds of thousands of followers. I have only more recently put the effort into growing Instagram and it's growing rapidly. Yeah. But uh, I'm never too busy to respond to real inquiries. I mean, I, you get these ridiculous DMs or someone's like, hey, do you want to buy followers? Or, you know, <laughs> hey, can I help you with your website? And you know, it's probably um, someone from Indonesia. It's like, no, sorry, guys. I want to organically grow your business. So we, we want to do the same. So we appreciate it. We want to put in the hard work. So again, man, thank you so much for being with us, guys. This is uh, the end of episode nine. Nueve. Thank you. <laughs> All right. There we go.